Welcome to Strip Cover Look, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. Uh, we are here for episode four of Ask Adrian Anything. This is also part of the Dirty 30 series. Um, and today's question comes to us all the way from uh, Shangri-La, where Celia lives. Uh, and the question is, top three novels, short stories, and poems that inspired you to become a writer, and how did they inspire you? I am going to change the scope of this question just a little bit um, and talk about them in novel, short story, poetry order because that is going to help me uh, really define what I'm talking about here. Uh, first off is obviously, and I hate to keep beating the same drum here, Fight Club. And I do not have a copy of my Fight Club because I loaned it out and, well, fuck me. So. Fight Club is a novel that I read at a time when I was trying to write a novel, and I was trying to understand what noveling really meant. And the story, so the themes in Fight Club are extremely convoluted. And the characters are a little bit messy, and they come and go in the story um, in ways that they don't necessarily need to, and in, in, in ways that are there's a difference between being unpredictable and being surprising and there's a bit of surprise to the way that the characters come and go in that story which all ultimately climaxes in a twist ending uh well a twist just before the ending so it is not a perfect novel but it is a story itself that is fairly simple enough that i read it while i was an undergrad and when you're reading all of those high literary pieces, sometimes you lose sight of just what storytelling is. And Fight Club is a novel that is a great example of storytelling because of the dangerous writing, because of the burnt tongue. And it is, it is a, a work that is itself. Uh, Fight Club does not try to be anything else. And for someone who was really making a first hard go at the novel format, which I'm, I'm still not a novelist. I still don't write novels. I still don't write that length of piece. But for someone who was making their first attempt at something, their first real attempt at something that size, it was helpful to see that the story can just be what the story is. Um, so that really helped me as far as the simplicity of story is concerned, but it also helped me because it was something that really spoke to me at the time. And it was something that when you're reading Fitzgerald and you're reading Joyce and you're reading Hemingway, to read something like that and to realize, oh, well, writing can be this too, is something that is very, very freeing uh, for a writer. Moving on to grad school, I was really concentrating on the short story format. And um, again, it become, you, you become a bit stilted when you're working on your craft and you're working on your craft and you're working on your craft and you're working on your craft. On your craft. Uh, it's easy to become stilted and to become uh, hermetically sealed in the box that is you. So... The Scribner Anthology of Contemporary Short Fiction, second edition, was something that really helped me because of the plethora of voices therein. Um, let's see if I can find the table of contents real quick just to read some of the names. We've got T.C. Boyle, Donald Bartholomew, Amy Bloom, Juno Diaz, Stuart Dybeck, um, Ron Hansen, A.M. Holmes, Kelly Link, George Saunders, ZZ Packer, uh, Joyce Carol Oates, Tim O'Brien, all of these different voices in here. And it's not, a, it's not a massive collection. There's a lot of stories, but it's still, I think, less than 700 pages. Yeah, about, six, about 650, maybe. Um, so... What I would do is I would wake up and I'd go to the library. I'd, I'd read a short story. I'd do whatever homework was there for grad school. 
then I'd write for a couple hours, then I'd go home, some days I would go to the gym, Some a lot of days I would not, um, to sort of get a break from how in-depth you're going there. And then from there, depending on the time, I would either go to a coffee shop and write, or I would uh, stay home and write. Um, and then after that, I would edit and keyboard, uh, type things up. But this collection of short stories was always a, a great jump to the day when it was the first thing I was doing. Because you would open it up and have no idea what voice it was that you were going to get. And uh, obviously a lot of the voices that I ended up reading off were the ones that I, I rather enjoyed because they were more along the dangerous writing burnt tongue course, right? Um, people who are not really afraid to do things with writing that other people aren't, aren't necessarily doing or are possibly afraid to do or experiment with words in ways that, that make things sound different and have a harder wallop when they hit you. But, that said, it was during this time that I really lost a bit of track of, of poetry. I think the only thing that I really read poetry-wise during those those years was Tracy K. Smith. Oh, I'm not going to remember the name of the collection, but it was the one, she, she won a lot of awards for it. Um... But during that, so before that, my, my poet was Emily Dickinson, right? Um, which is, she was a little bit of a break from tradition at her time, but today still reads very datedly. Well, I won't say she reads dated, but she's definitely not speaking about things that you're going to walk out in the street and hear talked about. Um, so it was during that time, after that time, I really wanted to regain some connection with poetry. Um, and I had I had a little bit of uh, experience with Bukowski, nothing great, uh, but a little bit, something to go off of. So I knew, I, you know, I'm going to pick up some Bukowski because he was still an author that I, I didn't really, I could enjoy, but I didn't think I got, right? There wasn't that connection with the works of Bukowski. Then I picked up uh, The Pleasures of the Damned. And The Pleasures of the Damned is, in addition to being such a great collection of Bukowski for so many different reasons, uh, it was the first collection of Bukowski, and I've said this a thousand times on the channel as well, that I read almost like a novel, that I just sat down and, and burned through. And because of that, you, you gain a greater appreciation for the things that are going on in Bukowski, but you also are cognizant of the fact that you don't have to be doing that to get a specific poem. However, it does add to the literary experience of the collective. So, for me, it was really nice to be able to see what that meant because I had never experienced that before and it was something that helped me on a writerly level for knowing what is what are the good things that you can leave out of a poem not have to tell someone and still communicate versus what are the things that really need other context uh, and for me Bukowski really really does a good job of traipsing that line between what doesn't have to be communicated, that doesn't have to be told to be communicated, uh, and what what really needs context to figure out. So, in the Bukowski collections, the poems add context to one another, but they, the absence of any poem in this collection would not greatly change uh, the interpretation that one might give to any other poem. It just adds to it. So... That was very interesting for me to see from a poetry perspective. 
Uh, and I hope I answered some type of question with my ramblings today. Uh, but that is all I think that I have got for this question. If you have a question, leave it in the comments below because I'm sort of running out of questions to answer. Um, if you like this sort of thing, hit like. If you have not already subscribed, I would appreciate it if you do so. And I hope to see you back for the next video in the Dirty 30 as well as the next Ask Adrian Anything.